The electron is orbiting in its lowest energy zone. But if it absorbs enough energy, the electron jumps into a higher orbit, a quantum leap. The energy the electron absorbs can come from radiation, such as light, or from other sources, such as electric flow. But electrons naturally want to be in their ground state, and to return there, they must shed this extra energy, which is released as quanta, or photons, with wavelengths characteristic of the atom structure. In fact, by analyzing radiation with special instruments, scientists can determine the composition of almost anything, from the sun to stars light years away. But we have our own energy detection systems, our ears, our eyes, which are tuned to their own specific ranges. Of most interest to us, of course, are our eyes. If atoms radiate or reflect energy at the correct wavelengths, then we can see their emissions and even identify some elements from experience. Neon radiates red and sodium radiates orange-yellow. But why do we see the wavelengths that we do? Certainly it must depend on the environment in which we evolved. And the most crucial influence in our environment is the sun. The sun's optical distribution uh, that arises on the surface of the Earth peaks at around the same point that this responsive of the human eye peaks, which is what evolution uh, would tell you would, would happen. And a species is going to derive vision where there's the most light. The correlation between the energy output of the sun and the sensitivity of our eyes is striking. The curves of both peak near 555 nanometers in the middle of our visual range. But in a further refinement, we are able to monitor energy levels in three different zones within the overall range. The result, color vision. Of course, in Newton's time, it wasn't at all clear what was happening. But Newton was able to surmise that the essence of color lay within us and not in the world around us. The key to the answer came from Newton's argument that ultimately the color vision is a problem of vision. It's not just a physical problem. And in the beginning of the 19th century, Thomas Young, a physician and a physicist, um, solved the problem when he proposed that the three colors are not out there. There aren't just red rays and yellow rays and blue rays in sunlight, but in fact, the, th the three, sort of the magic number of color theory, is in us, that we have three receptors. As we'll see, this insight does not only go a long way in explaining color vision, but also reveals how it is possible to create so many colors by using just a few. Early in the 17th century, it was discovered that painters could mix many colors using just three colors, red, yellow, and blue, what we now call the painter's primaries. This discovery pointed Thomas Young in the right direction for discovering the mechanism by which humans see color, because he proposed that three sets of receptors in our eyes enabled the phenomenon of three color mixing to occur. The eyes are extensions of the brain, energy collection devices, which, after detecting and cataloging wavelengths of light and their intensities, sends this information down the path of nerves, neurons, and ganglia to the brain, where it is used to present a picture of the world around us in our minds. The eye is made up of various layers. The outermost is the white sclera, which at the front of the eye becomes the transparent cornea, the eye's major focusing element. The colored part is the iris. It's a diaphragm which controls the amount of light that enters the eye. Behind the iris, the lens is responsible for the rest of our focusing ability. 
The light that passes through these elements is focused on the retina. To this point, light has obeyed all the laws that govern waves behavior, bending as it passes through the focusing elements of the eye. But as it impinges on the retina, it's the nature of light as photons that's important. The retina contains cells called rods and cones, whose photosensitive pigments respond to the photon's energy and send impulses down nerve fibers to the brain. There are approximately 126 million receptors in each eye, 120 million rods and 6 million cones. Although they're outnumbered by rods 20 to 1, it's the cones in the retina that enable us to see in color because each is tuned to one of three overlapping zones within the visible spectrum, blue, green, and red. When the brain analyzes the energy the eye receives, it processes the mixture of wavelengths into an image we call colored. The 120 million rods, however, all contain the same pigment and don't contribute to color vision. Rods sense only brightness differences and only at low levels of illumination. Cones need more light to work. As Young proposed, the eye's cone receptors are sensitive to three colors, but simple primary mixing in the eye was not the whole physiological story because it's been recognized that we don't have just three elemental hue sensations, but four. It's an opponent process theory because red and green are opponent in that they cannot be seen at the same time in the same place. We see something that's either red or green, but not reddish green. What you would see if red and green are mixed in proper proportion is white or gray, because red and green are complementary. Apparently this occurs because of the way the processing system that receives the eye's information is set up. Brightness is self-explanatory. That's the intensive dimension. Hue is what uh, we refer to as the redness or greenness or yellowness or blueness of, of a color. And the saturation refers to how much of that color is there. For example, a pink is a desaturated red. It's possible to have a pink and a red of the same brightness and hue. They're both equally red, but they differ in saturation. Opponent colors theory says that our perceptions of brightness, hue, and saturation are determined by the relative activities of chromatic neural channels of yellow-blue and red-green and an achromatic channel of white-black. So if we have a light that we see as white, it means that the opponent channels are at their balance point. They're not signaling anything. The only thing that's signaling anything is the achromatic channel, and so we see something that's either white or gray or black. If we see something that's pink, it's pink because we have strong activity in the red-green channel signaling redness, the yellow-blue channel is at equilibrium, signaling nothing. And the white-black channel is active, signaling whiteness. And the, the combined activity of white and red yields the sensation of pinkness. We have purple or violet. As a result of the way the eye and brain analyze light, certain rules govern the way colors mixed together appear. Colors are mixed by either additive or subtractive methods. The blending of colored lights from more than one source is additive, while the elimination of colors from light by absorbers is subtractive. Additive mixtures of red, green, and blue produce white where all overlap. Subtractive primaries of red, yellow, and blue produce black where all overlap. A common example of additive color mixing is television which uses small phosphor dots emitting red, blue, and green to mix all the colors in a picture. The process relies on an effect called mosaic fusion. At a distance, our eyes cannot resolve the distinction between individual dots, so we perceive different colors and shapes.